In this session, we're going to consider psalms of wisdom. There are a handful of psalms that are classified as wisdom psalms because they're for teaching. Uh, they instruct us in practical applications of knowledge. That's what wisdom is. It's a very practical, very real world, nitty gritty types of teaching. This psalm in particular, Psalm 73, the one we're going to look at, is a psalm that deals with one of the fundamental questions that all of us ask. That has to do with the problem of evil and suffering and why does suffering exist when God is good and powerful? Now, this is called a question of theodicy, according to philosophers, and the dilemma is stated this way. On the one hand, we know that God is good. He is all good. He cannot do evil. We also know that God is powerful, that there's nothing that's impossible for him. He's absolutely sovereign. He can do whatever he wants without any limitations. However, we also have the existence of this thing called evil. And so it raises the question, if God is good, then why does he allow evil to flourish? Maybe he's not good. Uh, maybe he is not what we think he is, and we question his goodness when evil is observed. Uh, or, on the other hand, perhaps God is good, but he's just not powerful enough to stop evil. And so we question his power. And the theodicy says that either God is good or powerful, but he can't be both, given the existence of evil. And so this psalm will wrestle with that question on a very personal level. It's a psalm of Asaph. Uh, there are three Asaphs that are mentioned in the Bible, all at different time periods. I'm going to assume that this Asaph and this psalm dates to the time of the exile. In fact, that's when book three was likely compiled. That's Psalm 73 through 89, most likely for use during the exile for the believers who were in captivity in Babylon. They're trying to wrestle with this very problem. Uh, so in 586 BC, a, a national trauma occurs. The Babylonian army comes in and they destroy the city of Jerusalem. They level the temple. Uh, they carry away a portion of the population into captivity in Babylon. And it raises a lot of questions for the Jewish people because God dwelt in his temple and yet the Babylonians leveled it. How could that be? Maybe God's not all powerful. Also, the captives. Uh, David was promised that one of his descendants would always be on the throne, and yet David's descendant, the king Zedekiah, he's in captivity in Babylon. Maybe God's not that powerful. And what about the promise to Abraham that the descendants uh, of Abraham would be like the stars of the sky? And, and here there's just a handful of survivors left from this national trauma. It raises this very question. Is God good? Is God powerful? And perhaps Asaph in Babylon is contemplating this when he writes these words. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are impure in heart. Now, this is the statement of a philosopher. This is the proposition. God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. I, I believe this. However, verse 2, here's the dilemma. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He says, I'm maybe wasting my time here because I look around me, I look around in Babylon and I see wealthy, powerful people. They're bad people, right? But good things are happening to them. That doesn't seem right. Why should I bother to be good? Am I being good for nothing? You might say. He goes on then to describe the wicked in verses 4 through 12. He looks around and he says, these people, verse 4, have no pangs until death. They are essentially pain-free. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They've never known hunger. They're in great shape. Uh, verse 5, they're not in trouble as others are. They don't have problems. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. They don't seem to ever get sick. Verse six, the pride is their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. In other words, they do whatever they want without consequence. Their eyes swell through fatness. In other words, they deny themselves nothing. If they see something, they get it. Their eyes swell with fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They, they speak and uh, scoff with malice and idly 
and loftily, they threaten oppression. They're, they're absolutely in charge. They're powerful. Now, verse 9, they set their mouths against the heavens. Their tongue struts through the earth. They say whatever they want. Whatever they say, that's truth. That's the way it is. Now, verse 10, therefore, his people turn back to them. And it seems that uh, Asaph is talking about the people of God, his people, turn to them and find no fault in them. In other words, uh, they are drawing believers into their lifestyle as well. Verse 11, they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? In other words, there's no God, there's no fear of judgment, there's no consequence for what we're doing. In verse 12, he sums it up this way by, say, by saying, behold, these are the wicked, always at ease, they increase in riches. Now, you have to acknowledge that's a very um, idealized version of uh, life outside of God. Uh, it's, it is the kind of that People magazine, uh, grocery store counter, all the rich and famous and the beautiful people. And we look at them and we think, boy, they got it, man. That's, that's the life. That's really living. That's, that's kind of where Asaph is. He's, he's not looking at this, thing, at this thing rightly, but that's how he feels. He feels like, why am I bothering to be good? You've probably heard the phrase, you know, why do bad things happen uh, to good people? Uh, this psalm is kind of the opposite of that. It's more like, why do good things happen to bad people? <laughs> and so he restates this dilemma in verse 13. He says, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. I'm a fool. I I I've, been de I've deceived myself. I'm wasting my time trying to be good because look at all these other people who aren't trying and look all the good things they got. <laughs> We see his heart condition then in verses 14 and following. All, he says, all the day long, I've been stricken, rebuked every morning. If I'd said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. And when I thought of how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. It seems like the only reason Asaph is maintaining his faith is for the sake of others. He doesn't want to let down the next generation, his children. He doesn't want to disappoint others, but his heart is not in it. He's just maintaining appearances. He's a leader. He's, he's got to toe the party line, so to speak. And so, but his heart is, is gone. He's out. Until the turning point. This psalm hinges on verse 17. When Asaph writes, until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I discerned their end. He went into the sanctuary. Now, if this is during the time of the exile, obviously there is no sanctuary. And so this may be metaphoric. This may be a sense of, of, of Asaph just realizing and experiencing the presence of God where he is. Uh, God's sanctuary can be anywhere. You can experience God anywhere because he is everywhere. And Asaph has this experience of encountering the reality of God, of seeing with spiritual eyes the spiritual reality that was all around him. Uh, it's, uh, it makes me think of the story of Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha, the prophet, at this point he's kind of old and uh, he's got a servant that's helping him and his, his servant uh, looks out there in the city of Dothan and he, and he sees that the, the enemy army has surrounded the city and there, there's no hope of escape. And the servant is just freaking out and saying, Elisha, what, what are we going to do? We're surrounded by an army. And Elisha calmly prays, O oh Lord, open his eyes, open his eyes. And his eyes are open and he sees the chariots of fire, the army of the Lord surrounding the enemy army. His eyes are open to this, this spiritual reality. And that's exactly the kind of experience that Asaph had in this moment. His eyes were open to see reality, to see truth, to see beyond uh, the veil that is this physical world. And he says, in reality, I've, I've got it all backwards. Verse 18, truly you set them in slippery, slippery places. He, he had said, my feet almost slipped, but actually they're the ones that are about to slip. You make them fall to ruin. Verse 19, how they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. Oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. They're the ones that are, that are phantoms, that are that are, that are less than the ultimate spiritual reality that, that he has seen here. It's a, it's a reversal, isn't it? Uh, now all of a sudden, he sees things completely differently. It's flipped and he sees that these lost, unbelieving people, they're the ones that are really on slippery ground. They're the ones that are going to face the consequences if they don't turn to God. 
verse 21, he says, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in my heart, I was brutish, ignorant. I was like a beast before you. It's a, it's a moment of repentance. He realized, man, I was stupid. Man, how did I allow myself to be deceived by what my eyes saw versus what my heart knows to be true? And, and then in verse 23 and following, we have what I think are some of the most beautiful words in the entire Psalter. He says in verse 23, nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with uh, your counsel. And afterwards, you'll receive me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He's been looking around the world and seeing all these good things that he doesn't have. And he has this moment of realization where he, it is clear to him of the good that he does have. He has God. The world and the lost, they may have all these things, but they don't have God. He may not have all the good things of this world, but he has God. And so he returns to restate the dilemma in the final two verses to, to sum it all up, to come to his conclusion. He says, for behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of your works. So how does the psalm answer the dilemma here? Is God good? Is God powerful? Yes. First of all, the psalmist clearly says that God is just, that he is in charge, that there will be a time of consequence the abolition, abolitionist um, Theodore Parker said that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. There's a certainty of justice, that there will be consequences for every careless word that is spoken, as what Jesus told us about that judgment. We can be confident God is just, God is powerful. What about God's goodness? The psalmist here, Dave, uh, Asaph, says that it is good to be near God may not be all the good things, all the wealth and power and health that this world might offer us, but it is a better good. It is a greater good. It is the goodness of the presence of God. In Psalm 16, 2, David says that apart from you, God, I have no good thing. John 17, 3, Jesus said, this is eternal life. This is the real quality life that is forever and that is to know you, the only God, and your son, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Knowing God, having God, being in relationship with God. The psalmist says that having this, there's nothing on earth that compares, that I desire besides you. God's goodness, yes. God gives us himself. God is good. God is just. And while he doesn't remove evil in this world, he will. In fact, the psalm hints at that. It says, and afterward, you will, you'll take me into glory when this world, my experience on it comes to an end, I will be in your presence forever. And God in Christ has ultimately given us victory over evil, over sin and death. It's defeated. Its days are numbered. I want to close with a prayer that was inspired by this psalm. It's a very old prayer, 6th century, a prayer by Dolan Forgale. He was an Irish monk. And uh, the story is that he went blind, that he studied so much that his eyesight gave out. And in his blindness, he wrote the words to this hymn, Be Thou My Vision. It's translated into English in the early 20th century and set to, set to an Irish tune. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great father and I thy true son. Thou with me dwelling and I with thee one. Riches I heed not nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart, high King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won, 
Oh, may I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O Lord of all. Be thou my vision. Lord, may we have that sanctuary vision, that experience that allows us to see the world as it really is, to see the lost as they really are, and to see God with us, holding us in his right hand, and afterwards taking us into glory.